Hi, buongiorno! Finally today we are going to walk in St. Peter's Square. I promise you that this walk is gonna change your vision of the square because it's not just about a bunch of bricks and marble. Bernini was assigned the task of completing the new St. Peter's by designing the surrounding square, which he did with his incredible success. He created a monumental complex that bridged two eras of the Renaissance and the Baroque. Even the novelist George Eliot summed his emotions with these words. The piazza with Bernini's colonnade gave me always a sense of having entered some millennial New Jerusalem, where all small and shabby things were unknown. So sadly, the effect was ruined in the 20th century by the destruction in the name of modernity and convenience of an entire side of the square. In conjunction with the demolition of the old Borgo. Like all great Roman squares, St. Peter's has its own aura, shaped obviously by the centuries old traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. These are best appreciated during the frequent ceremonies and holidays when the huge crowd, animated by the colorful garments of the many religious orders, gather in the square in a noisy but orderly scene. Such events include the announcement from the central balcony of the church of the election of a new pope and various ceremonial blessings given by the pope periodically either from the balcony or from his apartment window. Oh, by the way, on the right side you just seen the secret passage of the Pope. In the Middle Ages the Pope used to escape from his enemies running inside of that wall. Bernini was born in Naples, of a Florentine father and Neapolitan mother. Bernini inherited a Tuscan precision and a Neapolitan temper. He was harsh by nature, but passionate in his work. From early childhood, he was steeped in the artistic life of his father, a well-known sculptor. He was mesmerized by the masterworks of ancient, especially Hellenistic, sculpture and studied them coupled with a complete self-confidence. His talent assured him an extremely successful career from the start. He made his first important work at the age of 14. Amongst his countless works, St. Peter's Colonnade won him the widest acclaim. This may seem odd given that he was more famous as a sculptor than as an architect. Yet his greatness ultimately consisted in his extreme sensitivity to space and unique ability to fuse the architecture and sculpture. What intrigued him most in sculpture was the expressive potential, not so much of the rock, but of the surrounding void. He did not understand the one without the other. He often quoted Michelangelo's precept that it isn't hard to sculpt since all it requires is to remove from the stone, not add anything. He reinforced the psychological impact of his creation with multiple effects often drawing from more than one artistic field in the Renaissance tradition of the universal genius. You know, Bernini gave a public opera wherein he painted the scenes, cut the statues, invented the engines, 
compose the music, read the comedy, and build the theater. Thus, most of Bernini's works should be read not just as the products of a sculpture, but as those of, of an architect and set designer too. Another work that, together with the colonnade, exemplifies his dramatic and theatrical instincts is the row of angels crowning the bridge to Castel Sant'Angelo. If you didn't see yet the episode, go check it on the channel. Bernini's art was, like Michelangelo's, really consistent. In 56 years, he produced more than 100 of large works of statuary and architecture in and around St. Peter's, not to mention countless others in Rome. At the imposing colonnade by Bernini, there are 284 columns in rows of four. The skyline is dotted with a parade of more than 150 statues of saints, sketched by Bernini and sculptured by his assistants. Over the right colonnade rise the apostolic palaces of the popes. The papal apartment is in the great square building to the right. The window from which the pope blesses the crowd, except after his election, in that case he appears at the central balcony of the basilica, window is the second from the right on the top floor. The blessing, often followed by a speech, 
occurs on Sundays at noon when the Pope is in Rome. So I suggest if you don't want to miss the Angelus, you should arrive at least 30 minutes in advance. Because there's the metal detectors, the security and there's a lot of people. Let's go to the ancient Egyptian obelisk. It once stood in the center of Emperor Caligula's Circus and is where St. Peter was supposedly martyr. Caligula had needle brought to Rome in the 1st century AD and specially built 400 ton barge. The circus and obelisk were alongside the old basilica. By the Middle Ages, the obelisk was the only one left standing in Rome. It was a great attraction, partly because a bronze globe on top was believed to contain the ashes of Julius Caesar. During the construction of the new basilica in the late 16th century, Pope Sixtus V had the needle put here. The obelisk was the first raised in Rome since antiquity. Moving it from 300 yards away and hoisting it was an engineering feat that even Michelangelo had deemed impossible. But this task took 900 men and hundreds of horses and more than four months. The obelisk is the second tallest in Rome, measures 25.5 meters. It will be around 77 feet. But it is 38 meters high, or around 125 feet, including the pedestal, which is the base with Baroque lions and eagles, and the emblem on the top. The emblem, which contains a relic of the true cross, is the star mount of Pope Alexander VII Kiji, who completed the square. It also appears on a colonnade. On the base Latin inscription proclaims God triumphs over evil and announces the exorcising power of the obelisk. Further up, Near the eagles are ancient dedication to Caligula, whose real name was Caius. Yes, because Caligula was a nickname meaning little boot. After the military style shoes he wore as a child, which won him the affection of soldiers. And uh, the other two sides, they recall the role of Sixtus V. I want to tell you a secret. Bernini has achieved a special masterpiece with the colonnades. He has aligned the columns towards the center. There is a mark on the floor for the center of the colonnades. 
So if you stand on the marking, you will see the columns line up so that the three rear columns disappear behind the first column. The diameter of the columns increases outwards in order to preserve the proportions. Bernini also had to consider the slope of the site when building the colonnades. So, right now we're in the center of the perspective of the right side. Just look at the difference with the left side. None of the columns are aligned. On the right side of the façade is even possible to see the Sistine Chapel. And contrary to the popular belief, Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel in a standing position. You know, when the picture of Michelangelo creating his legendary frescoes, most people assume he was lying down. But in fact, the artist and his assistants used wooden scaffolds that allowed them to stand upright and reach above their heads. Michelangelo himself designed the unique system of platforms which were attached to the walls with brackets. So the impression that Michelangelo painted on his back might come from the 1965 film The Agony and the Ecstasy, in which Charles Heston portrayed genius behind the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Let's talk about the façade of this incredible basilica. The façade of St. Peter's Basilica was built by Carlo Maderno. He was also responsible for the construction of the long nave and the porch, which were attached to the central building designed by Michelangelo. In order to not cover Michelangelo's dome, the façade had to remain as low as possible. <coughs> After the façade was completed, around uh, the 1612, it was decided to erect two towers on the right and left. However, the towers could not be completed because of the subsidence, and the buildings ended at the height of the façade. The columns of the façade are laid out in a colossal order, which means that the columns go over several floors. There are five passages to the portico, with bronze grills on the lower floor and five balconies on the upper floor. Jesus, John the Baptist and the eleven apostles are enthroned above the façade. Peter is missing because the basilica, of course, is dedicated to him. His statue is also on the left in the forecourt. Each of these statues are around 18 feet, so around 5.7 meters tall. I hope you enjoyed the tour, for more episodes hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and leave me a review. Let me know what you enjoyed most about the walk. For next episode, stay tuned. Thank you.